My topic is, are we training thermostats or are we training thermometers? And it's an analogy that we can apply not just to teachers, but to principals, to anyone actually in education. And I just want to have a look at what, what does a thermometer actually do? A thermometer you put into an environment, it measures the environment, you take it out, and it has not done anything. The difference between that and a thermostat is the thermostat does what a thermometer does, it measures, but it then assesses the environment that it's in, it then adjusts itself, and then makes the necessary adjustments to the environment, and then reassesses. So the whole question here is, are we training teachers that are just going in and assessing, not looking at the environment, not making the necessary changes, or are we training people that are taking into consideration the area, taking into consideration the type of learners in their classroom and the environment they're dealing with, and then changing themselves to actually have an outcome that is effective? Now the big question is how do we actually make sure that our teachers are thermostats and not thermometers? And I'm going to look at this in two ways. The one is what must we put into our training to ensure that they, they do become th thermostats? And the other side of it is what sort of qualities are we looking, in te looking at in teachers? And I use the, 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 the term teachers and educators actually for everyone in education. And I'm going to give you five very quick and brief um, key principles that I feel is necessary to ensure that we have thermostats. The first is vision. If we don't have vision, we don't know where we're going. And this quote, sorry, I don't know whether people at the back can see, but this I think sums up so much. Vision without action is a daydream. We often talk, we, th we say what we want to achieve, but we don't actually do it. But the other is even more dangerous. Action without vision is a nightmare. Just acting and not knowing where we're going, what we're actually aiming for and where we're getting to. So teachers need to be encouraged to say, what do you actually want to achieve? What are, and I use the word outcomes, what are the outcomes you want to achieve? I love this slide. Because we need to start looking at vision differently. We need to start saying to our teachers and people in education, what do you actually aspire to be? I'll give you an example. You ask a teacher, what do you want to be in 10 years' time? Some of them might say a principal. So what do you say to them? The first thing is you say, what characteristics does a principal have? And they'll rattle off fantastic characteristics. They'll rattle off, oh, they want them to be professional, they must be on time, they must be good communicators, good presenters, um, trustworthy, reliable. And then you turn it back to them and say, okay, fine, if that's what a principal needs to become, or that's what you want to be, what sort of habits do you have to create now to ensure that when you are a principal, you will have those characteristics? And that goes not just for principals, it goes for anyone in education. Where do you want to get to? Look at the key characteristics and start forming the habits now. I think this is so true for us in education, particularly in South Africa. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and that we miss it, but it's that, that it's too low and that we... I always use the example, if, if you think back and all of you sitting in the room, Think back to the first time um, when you were a teenager, when the opposite, someone who you were attracted to, um, told you for the first time that they loved you. Um, okay, we might not have known at that age what love was, but for then it was a very important thing to us. Um, now, the first time our children are hearing that, well, they're actually not hearing it. They're getting it over an SMS saying, I love you. Um, and these sort of things, we've forgotten how to express ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that technology is not good. We've got to look at how do we balance it? How do we communicate with technology where it's appropriate? In the same way, where do we communicate where it's appropriate face-to-face? -face? And we've l we're losing those skills. So we must remember that communication is not... P sorry, pa okay. 
communication is something we need to start developing and, and keep developing. The third is adaptability. Um, we live there's, we have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring us. We don't know what's going to happen in our country. We are preparing learners for jobs that don't even exist. And we need to be adaptable as teachers, as educators, as managers. And we sometimes forget, we, we always put change in a negative light. We sometimes forget that the only way to grow is through change. And the only way to progress is through change. And the next slide that I'm going to show you you probably all look at that and agree with me. Leaders, teachers are leaders in the classroom. They are probably the driving force of our future. And if they aren't adaptable to change and teach our learners how to be adaptable to change, we're in serious trouble. Have a look at that first picture right at the end. How many of you in this room had a gr gramophone player? OK, quite a lot of you. They were phased out in the 1980s, not that long ago. How many people still have one and use one every day? Probably maybe one of you in the room. We've changed in 20 years in an amazing rate, or at an amazing rate, and we're going to keep changing. How many of you in the room have a watch on your arm, a wristwatch? Put up your hands. OK, 80% of the room probably. You ask that same question to 15, 16 year olds. I can guarantee you. Only about one to two to three learners in a class will have a wristwatch on. Why? Because they don't see the point of buying a device that only does one thing. What's the point of having a watch that only, does, only tells the time? And these are the sort of changes that our kids are going through and that we must start adapting to. The fourth, and I probably put that as this is the most important, is self-realization. Knowing who you are, what you want to achieve, and knowing a little bit more about yourself. There are six people on the screen. I'd like you to look at those six people and choose two. Each of you for yourselves in the room, choose any two of those people. Right, can I just get one or two people to give me feedback? Which two did you choose? Uh, Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa. Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa. Anyone choose anyone different? Nelson Mandela and Oprah. Nelson Mandela and Oprah, thank you. Oprah and Mother Teresa. Oprah and Mother Teresa? Mandela and Gandhi. Mandela and Gandhi? Mandela and Gandhi? Mandela and Oprah? Mandela and Obama? Mandela and Obama? Always for brains. Branson, OK. <laughs> Branson's the one I go for, too. Um, now, folks, I want you to do, think now of the two people that you chose. And if you've got a pen and paper in front of you, you could do this. Otherwise, just, just think about it. I'd like you to write down any two words that you would use to describe those two people. So you're going to have four words, two for the first one and two for the second. Any two words that you would use to describe those people that you chose. Right, let's get some feedback on the sort of words. Anyone want to share with us some words that they use to describe? Mandela. Wise. Wise. Wisdom. Wisdom. Humble. Humble. Non-violence. Non -violence. Honest. Honest. Courage. Courage. Selfless. 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 Change. Change. Humble. And so we can go on, go on and so on. Rich, <laughs> brilliant, there's an honest person. <laughs> now let's have a look why you chose these two people. You chose them for one of two reasons. You either chose that person or those people because you see yourself as that person. 
all, and this is for a lot of us, we aspire to be like that person. Now the big question is, and I'm seeing lots of heads nodding, so hopefully I'm, I'm right there on that assumption. The question that I'd like you to ask yourselves now is those four words that you wrote down there, <coughs> how many people would describe you using those four words? <laughs> yeah, the rich one's probably the only one we'll actually be honest about. But this, this is something that we forget. We, we don't look and there are two sides to, to teachers and there's two sides to any human being. The first is how we see ourselves. And there I love this picture because it's a little kitty cat looking in the, in the mirror and seeing themselves as a lion. And then the other side of it, which we very seldom want to look at, is how do other people see you? And for me, the most important is for teachers, in order to be effective thermostats, they need to know what that gap is. They need to know how do they see themselves and how do other people see them? In other words, where are their weaknesses? Where do they need to improve? Because until we know where our weaknesses are, we can't improve, we can't change, we can't grow. And this is something we need to look at more and more in teacher training. The very last, in teacher training, in anything in education, we need to keep focus of what is education actually about. At the end of the day, it's about the children. It's not about politics. It's not about power struggles. It's not about all these other aspects that creep in. And we need to remember that the kids we are training today, the teachers that we are training, are the future union leaders, are the future ministers of education, are the future government officials. And if we train them correctly now, and we instill this in of what the focus of education actually is, hopefully that will instill a process that we go through that we will have the change that we want to see. We tend in South Africa and actually all over the world to not look 10, 15 years down the line. We tend to look at now. How do we solve the problems now? And that's not wrong, but we mustn't do that to the detriment of what's going to happen in 15 years' time. And to end, to summarize, and, and really it's focusing on the last point, but also to summarize the whole of uh, my presentation, I'd like to show you another video clip. And um, it's a story and it gets told better on the screen than I could do it. What I'd like to do, I'd like to share a little story here with you. It's a very tender story. It was sent to me by someone who sends me beautiful things in the mail. And I call it the Teddy story. And I'd like to read this to you if I can do it without tearing up. And this story illustrates this as well as anything I've ever seen. There's a story many years ago of an elementary school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Thompson. As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy and that he constantly needed a bath. Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen and making bold X's and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records and she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and he has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. 
He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest, and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy's withdrawn and doesn't show up much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends, and sometimes he even sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem, and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and, and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in his heavy brown paper that he got from the grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled her children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On the very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and instead, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him and his mind seemed to come alive, the more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class, and despite her lie, became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under the door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he stayed in school and stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the very best and favorite teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. But the story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did, and guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with uh, several rhinestones missing, and she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson came with tears in her eyes and whispered back, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Isn't that a beautiful story? Yeah. Folks, I think that just sums up the whole aspect of thermo thermometers versus thermostats. And that we don't just go in and do our job because that's what we have to do. That we actually do it to make a difference. Thank you very much.